So today I'm going to talk about uh, monitoring your gluten-free diet. So we've talked about getting diagnosed and what foods you can eat, uh, but how do you know after the fact, right, once it's all said and done, that, that you're doing it right? And I think that's been a big question mark for uh, a really long time, and uh, we just launched our product, Gluten Detective, which you guys should all have in your um, welcome packs, and so you can try the product out. And uh, this is the first and, and only a uh, new post-consumption monitoring tool um, on the market. So we're very excited about it, and I'll tell you a little bit about it. So in terms of, uh, let's think about, we've heard of a lot of the different tests today and, and how they can be used in diagnosis, but let's uh, think about them in terms of monitoring your diet, again, after the fact that you've eaten the food. So there's the symptoms, obviously, um, very clear to a lot of people, but not all, in terms of if they think that they've eaten gluten. But as uh, Sheila pointed out, Earlier today, uh, there's a lot of variability, right, in terms of the, the level of gluten that individuals have to have. And so even if you're not having symptoms, you could be consuming uh, small amounts of gluten that, that you're unaware of. Uh, there's the biopsy, which is obviously the intestinal damage. Uh, serology, which is looking at the immune response to the antigen, the gluten antigen. And there's food tests that you can obviously see with uh, NEMA is the new one that, that came out last year. Uh, if you're eating gluten before you eat it, and uh, we'll talk about at the end our test, which is the stool and urine test that tests for GIPs, which stands for gluten immunogenic peptides, and uh, that's essentially chopped up fragments of, of gluten as it comes out and it's excreted in urine and stool. So uh, how do how do these uh, different methodologies stack up in terms of uh, clinical data that's been collected on them uh, over the years over various publications? Uh, in terms of their ability to uh, monitor and, and indicate that there, there is good compliance or, or there's not good compliance. Uh, so in terms of, of symptoms, and, and you'll find some different numbers depending on what study you look, but I think these are kind of uh, middle of the road and uh, most, most experts would agree with them that uh, approximately 60% of people with celiac disease still continue to experience symptoms even though they're on a strict gluten-free diet, um, and that's usually monthly or, or even more frequently than that. Uh, in terms of the biopsy, uh, there's one study that indicates that a year after being on strict gluten-free diet, uh, nearly half of people are, are still not healed. So the assumption here is that there's still gluten creeping in into their diet. Uh, serology, uh, again, after a year of being on the gluten-free diet, uh, again, these are celiac patients. 30% uh, of, of people, uh, regardless of, uh, I think, which of the serology tests you're looking at, continue to have elevated levels, so they, they haven't normalized after a year, again, indicating uh, that there's still gluten in the diet. Uh, food tests, this is the NEMA uh, data that we saw recently at the Columbia Symposium, that 30% of both uh, restaurant foods and packaged foods that are claiming to be gluten-free are testing positive with the, the NEMA sensor uh, by consumers. And the last uh, point here, we have uh, lots of different studies, and so the numbers uh, with our urine and stool test have ranged anywhere from 30 to 85 percent of people testing uh, positive with the urine and stool test. So uh, obviously, regardless of how hard we try, gluten is pretty much creeping into to everyone's diet at, at some point or another, again, regardless of if you uh, have symptoms or, or what those symptoms may be. So in terms of uh, looking at the pros and cons of each of these, uh, the symptoms, obviously, it's uh, oftentimes a rapid response for people. Uh, you feel very comfortable with it because you've obviously lived with uh, those for a long period of time and, and familiar with how your body responds. Uh, but again, uh, there's no correlation between uh, safe levels of gluten consumption and symptoms, um, unfortunately. And there's also the people who don't have symptoms, right? And so this is not generally a reliable method um, to rely on to, to make sure that your gluten uh, that your diet is gluten free. Um, you could potentially be confusing those symptoms with other things such as other food allergies, uh, IBS, uh, flu, or um, you know other um, uh, infectious diseases that may be going around at any given time. Um, and so again, this is a very subjective measure, right, and uh, not a scientifically valid one. Um, so if you want to think about looking at the biopsy, um, this is, again, the gold standard for diagnosis, as, as most of you know and uh, have experienced it firsthand. Uh, this is a pretty uh, definitive assessment of uh, how well you're, you're healing uh, in, in the gut, uh, which is the most important uh, outcome. 
Uh, the cons, obviously, it's, it's unpleasant, it's expensive, right? No one wants to do it more than once, <laughs> and a lot of doctors uh, won't do it more than once. And so, uh, again, not really a practical way of, of monitoring compliance with the diet. Uh, you know, some physicians may do it a year or two or three years after initial diagnosis, but beyond that, it's not going to be uh, utilized and probably can't convince your physician to do it either, and I'm sure that you wouldn't want to. Uh, in terms of the serology, uh, these are, again, the blood tests. They're pretty cheap. They're pretty specific for celiac disease. Uh, they're kind of the standard of care, as we heard a lot of people talk about today. Uh, and they're, they are useful for measuring uh, your return to normal, right? So over the course of that first year or two or three years, uh, it is valuable to see those levels reduced, knowing that you are doing better on the diet, but it doesn't mean that you're still doing good enough, necessarily. And so that's the, the con side of it. So even if you do have a normal uh, serology levels, uh, there have not been any good studies that have indicated that that correlates uh, perfectly with the biopsy results, which is why you still have to do the, the biopsy, right, to get diagnosed. And so essentially the, the serology test, again, it's your body producing the antibodies to, um, well, or to gluten or the, or the various uh, uh, different uh, biological biomarkers in, in, in the process, uh, the cascade process. Um, and so it takes a lot of gluten over a long period of time for those biological processes to be activated. And so that's what makes it not a good monitoring tool is because you can eat uh, you know, a piece of bread today and do good for the rest of the month and uh, your serology levels are, are not going to reflect that, right? And so you can't use the serology test to detect individual events of consuming gluten, right? And the challenges with that, obviously, you have to have a physician order, you have to go into the lab and get the phlebotomy done. So even if it did work, the logistics of it uh, are not practical either. So food testing. Uh, so we have the NEMA sensor up here in the top right. There's actually a food uh, testing kit that uh, is based on the same technology as the urine and stool kit uh, called Gluten Tox Home. Uh, we don't actually sell that. Uh, another distributor does, but you can find it on, on Amazon. Um, it's on the, on the left there. Uses the same ad antibody again as our urine and stool kit. Uh, so again, the pros here are you know before you eat it, right? So obviously it's great to be able to not take chances in that aspect. Um, but the con side, uh, as you guys probably know if you've used uh, any of these, is that it can be impractical with some meals. If you have a five course meal and each course contains five different ingredients, you're not going to sit at the table and make tw do 25 tests that each take three minutes and cost, you know, eight to ten dollars a piece, right? Um, not to say that, you know, in some situations where it, food is highly suspect, it can be very valuable. Um, and again, most foods aren't uniform, so even if you select, you know, the five ingredients off your plate, uh, there could have been one of them on the other side of your plate that was contaminated and, and you're not going to pick that up, right? Um, Hydrolyzed gluten is not detected with uh, these tests generally and uh, depends on the sample size and the density in terms of the amount of gluten that you're getting into the, the, the test, so that can add some complexities to it. And obviously there's the social aspect of it as well, right? Uh, again, you're not going to want to sit at a fancy restaurant for 25 minutes <laughs> testing your food. So uh, those are, are what we feel are the, the challenges. On food testing, and of course, I'm going to promote Gluten Detective <laughs> as the best option here, right? And this is, again, the product that we launched, uh, well, it launched worldwide. So um, our company, Glutenostics, is the exclusive uh, commercial entity for this technology in North America, but it's sold in pharmacies through distributors um, in mostly Europe currently as Gluten Detect, and it was, again, launched worldwide in uh, October, November of last year. Um, so the things that we see are being the pros of this technology is it's, it can be very easily done in 10 to 20 minutes uh, in the privacy of your own bathroom as frequently as you want. Um, it's about $20 per test. It's highly specific for, uh, again, the actual gluten molecule chopped up as it's excreted in urine and stool. So you're not, again, probing a biological response to the, the antigen. You're actually measuring uh, gluten itself in the same way that you do in the food test. Um, it's convenient at home format, similar to a pregnancy test, uh, particularly the urine version. Uh, the stool uh, version, which is the one you have in your kits, requires an additional extraction step, so it's a little bit more involved. 
Um, and the best part is really that you can detect discrete events. So you can detect particular transgressions in the diet. And there's still a little bit of detective work you have to do. Um, say you get a urine test positive this morning, it could have been anything that you ate in the past 24 hours. So you do have to do some, uh, some critical thinking in terms of what, what you ate and what could be um, suspect or restaurant that you went to. Uh, again, is probably the most common situation we get where people are interested in using the test. Um, the con side, uh, the stool test, as I'll talk in a minute, is uh, 10 times more accurate, not accurate, 10 times more sensitive uh, than the urine test, simply because that's how gluten is cleared from the body. So really for celiac disease, we, we feel that uh, the stool test has a sensitivity that's uh, more at the level of what a cross-contamination event is going to be, which is probably the, the most common scenario where you may uh, accidentally consume gluten. Uh, so we are the first and only uh, at-home um, poop test in the world, as far as we know. And most people obviously don't like playing with their poop, so uh, we will list that as a, as a con here. Uh, we realize that. Um, in terms of, there are some individual variabilities in the metabolic rates, uh, depending if you have constipation or diarrhea or just the way you naturally metabolize food in general. And so when you're first working with the test, it's probably advisable. Uh, to do multiple tests over, you know, if, you, if you've been contaminated or you're very, fairly certain you are, um, to do multiple urine or stool tests over the course of a day or two um, to kind of see how it clears from your body because we have found individuals that uh, may clear it very quickly and others that it may persist for um, even as long as a week in the stool, uh, actually with very small amounts, although that's, uh, again, kind of an outlier case. Uh, usually clears about two or three days, about three days through the stool and 24 hours in urine. Um, and so a false, so there's not really any false positives as far as we're because the, the antibody is highly specific for gluten. But if you miss that time window, you could get a false negative. So if you ate uh, gluten today and you didn't do the urine test tomorrow and you waited the following day to do the urine test, uh, you know, you would probably miss that event. Uh, but that would be an, an instance where it'd be more appropriate to do the stool test at, at day two and see. Um, so what are gluten immunogenic peptides? It is the 44 amino acid um, segment that um, Jennifer was talking about earlier that's um, resistant to digestion, digestion, so there's no enzymes in the, the human digestive tract that breaks them down. Um, and it doesn't matter if you have celiac or gluten sensitivity or, or you're healthy, it's again just the, the peptides that we're measuring as we're coming out, so this isn't specific. Um, to celiac disease, but that specific sequence, which is the, the green one here in the loop you see, uh, is actually responsible for activating the immune system in celiac disease. So that's why the test is highly specific for, um, for gluten. Um, again, it's a direct measure of the gluten as opposed to a biological response, and it's uh, more highly concentrated about tenfold in feces than it is in urine. And so in terms of uh, how and when to use the two tests, so in urine, usually six to 16 hours is optimally when it, it starts or it begins excreted around hour six and is usually gone. After 16 hours, um, it's best to use first morning urine, particularly if it was an evening or late afternoon event that you're suspecting. Um, and this is true for any urine test, simply because everything's gonna be more concentrated in the morning because you haven't urinated all night, um, and the urine test can detect about 500 milligrams, which is equivalent to a bite or two of something that contains, that's blatantly um, gluten-containing. So say a, a, you take a bite of a bagel or, or a sandwich that wasn't made with gluten-free bread, um, those events should show up positive with the urine test versus the stool test. So it takes a couple of days generally to make uh, any food's way through its uh, your intestinal tract, and so usually day two is the best time to use the stool test, but it's an order and magnitude more uh, sensitive, so it can detect 50 milligrams, which is like a, a crumb of bread, so more, again, on the line, along the lines of a contamination event, and we suspect that diarrhea may shorten that window, so it may come out shorter than two days if you have uh, a lot of diarrhea, but we don't have uh, any data on that right now. Uh, so this is a study uh, that was done in Spain, and here we were looking at uh, the, this was a, the urine study, I believe, um, and people doing a, a, a follow-up biopsy after diagnosis, and essentially what you see here is the gray and the black bars are people who are testing positive with our, our urine test, and the white bar are those that were testing negative, and you see in the biopsy results that the MARSH zero, which is a to totally normal, healthy, uh, villi, which is the upper left-hand corner of that, that picture there, 
uh, essentially everyone was testing negative with our test, and for those with uh, lots of intestinal damage, so MARSH-2 and MARSH-3, 100% uh, of them were testing positive. So we do really feel that it correlates um, to uh, very precisely to gluten consumption, and that that, again, is related to the downstream effects, which includes intestinal damage. Um, and we do have some additional studies uh, with several major institutions around the country. We're gathering additional data on, on, on this and, and other um, aspects of the, the clinical utility. So you'll probably start seeing this work its way into the kind of the, the standard of care for celiac disease over the next couple of years, we believe, or trying. Um, and there's a couple of recent publications that just came out this year um, that indicate uh, the utility and uh, the willingness of the medical community to accept this technology. So the top one is a recommendation from 19 of the world's top celiac experts, and they unanimously agreed that this technology is uh, important and should be used to monitor outcomes in, in celiac patients. Uh, monitor their compliance with the gluten-free diet, essentially. And another publication down uh, at the bottom here um, that someone was referring to earlier, I can't recall who, um, in this uh, paper, which was a meta-analysis, they determined that uh, symptomatic celiac patients, which is, again, 60% or more of the population, are routinely consuming 150 to 400 milligrams of gluten a day, which is a lot and definitely not safe. Uh, for, for patients with celiac disease. So uh, again, we're hoping to be able to Im help people improve uh, the way th their diet by, by using this as a, a tool to monitor and, and modify behavior. Uh, so no prescription is required. It's an over-the-counter test. You can buy it uh, pretty much exclusively through our website. We do stock it at a couple of pharmacies. Uh, it's about $20, uh, not currently reimbursed by insurance, but maybe in the future, uh, not currently regulated by the FDA either, although we have had that discussion with them. Uh, this is the procedure I'll skip through. You guys can look that over on your own. Uh, but essentially, the readout's much like a pregnancy test. So if a little red line shows in the window, then you know you've been contaminated. So that's uh, pretty much what I have. Um, you know, a lot of this is maybe a real quick question um, we get is, oh, I've been contaminated. So what? I, what's what's the value in a positive result? Well, then again, that's where the detective work uh, kind of comes in. So get Shelley Case's book. It's the best in the industry. And these are some of our dietitians at the bottom uh, that do um, phone or virtual, virtual consultations. You can get their information off of our website. So thank you.